Welcome to the Calvary Baltimore Weekly Sermon. Here's today's teaching. Happy Lord's Day. I would like to draw your attention this morning to James chapter 3. Whoop, whoop. So today, we study what seems to be the focal point of the letter, and that is a topic about the Christian tongue. So this is a fun one. (laughs) James, we have to remember, is writing to a persecuted church, and this church is being lied about, they're being slandered, and are deeply concerned, uh, James is, about how the church responds to these slanderous accusations. And let's be honest, if you were dragged out of your house in the middle of the night and brought to court and lied about incessantly, uh, the last thing on your mind would be, how do you respond in a Christian way with your mouth? Wouldn't that seem like a secondary issue when you're in those jail bars? Don't curse so much, right? You'd be like, you're swatting at flies right now. But this is not a secondary issue. To James, this is the issue. This seems to be structurally the absolute center of the book. This seems to be possibly the reason why he wrote the book. Uh, James introduced in James 1.26, if anyone thinks he is religious but does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Oof. To James, how a Christian speaks, how a Christian uses their tongues is of immense importance. In fact, James feels so strongly about how a Christian is to speak, he talks about a Christian who has no control over his tongue as someone who is deceiving themselves, as someone who has literally a worthless religion, meaning a religion that has no effect on someone's life. And we've all met people like this. They claim to be a Christian, and they are completely unchanged by it. So James now is going to unpack for the next 12 verses what it means to have a bridled tongue that those with true religion or saving faith possesses. Have you ever laid in bed late at night and go, boy, I hope I, when, if I pass away tonight, God says, hi, child, <laughs> I hope I'm a believer. Well, James is giving us one of the metrics with which to discern this if we have real religion There will be some mastery over the tongue. Let's read it. Verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that he who teaches will be judged with a greater strictness. (laughs) My Uncle Bob, uh, who was... Does anyone remember my Uncle Bob, Bob Shirell? He was the best. (laughs) He was... (laughs) He was the janitor of this church for many, many years. And he used to have a saying that he would tell my father. He says, Rick, everybody wants my microphone, but nobody ever fights me over my mop. (laughs) And here James is instructing the church to fight for the mop. (laughs) That yes, it's a wonderful honor to be a pastor. It's a wonderful honor to be a teacher, to run Bible studies, but with that great honor comes a great responsibility, a greater strictness, that that a teacher is not only called to preach the Word of God with clarity, but that a teacher must live the Word of God without compromise, which is why when we see sin in pastors and church leaders, it is so disgusting because it's antithetical to to the message. Jesus said in Luke 12, 47, And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. So let me tell you, This verse means a great deal to me personally. It was something I knew heading into the pastorate that if I was going to do this, that my life had to look different. I had to be a godly man. Augustine says, you will know a man's religion by what he does with his solitude. I knew that if I was to be a pastor, I had to live it when no one was looking. 
And this is exactly what James is getting at. The higher, the more that God uses you, and what an immense honor. What an honor when God says, I want to use you to reach this person. I want to use you to do this group, to do this thing. With that comes a more strict judgment. Now, we should desire, we're told, to, to want to teach, to want to be in these positions. But with that comes an acknowledgement of the seriousness of the calling. We are to answer this calling with the utmost seriousness and zeal for God's household. Also, logistically, the more, if you're a teacher, what do you have to do more of than most people? Speak. <laughs> so part of what James is saying is, this church is having, not this church, but James's church, maybe this church, but James is talking to a group of people who are having a hard time controlling their tongues. There's, they're being persecuted from place to place, and they're murmuring. They're grumbling. There's 1776 plotting a good plan. And James says, you guys better be real careful. If you want to step into that pulpit, you want to go and teach, you're going to be talking even more than you already are, and you're going to come under a greater condemnation. So this is a real warning starting at the leadership down, but we must guard our mouths. Verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. James now points out that we all stumble. You know that? <laughs> you know you're going to make a mistake today? <laughs> well, you might not know, but I know you will. <laughs> we all make mistakes. To err is to human. But then he says that anyone who has control of his tongue is a mature man. That word for perfect here in the Greek means likely to mature. That he is a mature man. Verse 2 seems to be saying, in your flesh, you will never gain control over your tongue. But if you did gain control over your tongue, as a mature Christian, it will help you gain control over your whole body. Now, this may seem like a contradiction, but he's going to answer it in a bit. Let's keep moving. Verse 3. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole body as well. So really funny. I was actually at a horse farm, not this Sunday, but last and there were all these little girls riding horses. Uh, they were like seven to 10. One was three foot high. It was adorable. And she was riding this horse that outweighed her by 10 times, you know, this huge horse. And she, she had the, the, the reins, the, the bit was in the horse's mouth, and as she pulled and pushed the reins, she controlled this giant animal. Well, this is exactly what James is talking about that this little bit inside of a giant horse that could kill anybody, if you just give it a little yank, it'll direct not just the, the, the horse's mouth, but the entire body. And James is saying, if we can control our tongues, the entire direction, the entire course of our life can be altered. Verse four, look at the ships also. They are so large and are driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So James is saying the same exact thing, just using a different analogy. So if you've ever heard a preacher and they keep saying the same thing over and over and over again, well, there might be an issue there, but it also can be biblical. And so instead of a big horse and a tiny little uh, bridle uh, in the mouth, now James talks about big ships with little rudders. That a big ship, even in bad winds, can be steered and directed by... Uh, a sailor or a, a fisherman. Same thing with the mouth. Verse 5, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest. Now, um, if you've ever been to the Holy Land, you're going to realize there's not a lot of forests. Uh, this word also can mean brush. So, and that seems to be more likely to the context of Judea how great the forest or, or, or the brush uh, is set ablaze by such a small fire. So now James is talking about a brush fire. Yeah, and again, for the third time, he's saying the same thing, just in a different way. James now says that just how brush fires can be massive, they can totally alter the landscape of, 
of a country, of a farming community, uh, and yet they begin with the tiniest little spark. And soon everything changes. Again, he connects that to the tongue. Verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. Whew. You ever speak and go, boy, that wasn't very kind. <laughs> that wasn't very Christian. Well, it's because your, your tongue can be set on fire by hell. <sighs> Question, where else in the scriptures do we see fire tongues? <laughs> Pentecost. This is our holiday today. Uh, we're going to get to that in a minute, but God can replace our tongue is what we're taught in the New Testament. Satan has our tongue until he doesn't, and then God gives us a new tongue. But if we let Satan have our tongue, he will use even a little spark if you give it to him to burn down your entire life. Uh, verse 7, for every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Uh, when I started this passage, I'm like, huh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, what I believe James is pointing to here is in Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Who named all the animals? Adam. With his tongue, he asserted dominion over them. And interesting enough, when we get to Genesis chapter 3, when the serpent came into the garden and tempted Eve, Adam was silent. His tongue was not used for the glory of God. He did not show dominion over the serpent, and so it burnt his life to the ground. So sometimes a refusal to use our tongue can be just as evil as using it inappropriately. So we must speak up sometimes. Verse 8, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless, uh, restless evil, full of deadly poison. Isn't this fascinating? No human can tame their tongue. Then why is James telling us to tame our tongue, right? Isn't that a logical question? You'll never fix it, try to fix it. <laughs> You're gonna drown, but try swimming a little, right? Why is James telling us you'll never win? You'll never gain control over our tongues, not gonna happen. Set on fire by hell, full of evil, deadly poison. James wants the church to know that even though we're all sinners, even though we all make mistakes, even though all of us can easily say evil and poisonous things, James wants the church, God wants you to tame your tongue. And the question is, how? How do I do this? Now, there's a little interesting detail in here that is not wasted. Who cannot tame the tongue? And it says man, humans. So loved ones, here's one of the many gifts of belonging to Jesus Christ and being indwelled with the Holy Spirit, which today again is Pentecost Sunday. This is perfect. That there is a wisdom from above. There is an Acts 2, a new tongue that God can give you that comes from above. Verse two says, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a mature man. <laughs> a large part of the church as a whole is that we have come to accept a really weak and pitiful God. Hmm. People have made God's ability limited to mankind's ability. That it'll never happen. <laughs> Can't be done. Not happening. But our God is not weak. The Spirit of God can do what the flesh could never do. If you've been struggling with something for a decade or more, and you go, well, this is, I'm just broken. No, you're not. 
The same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave, if you have faith, is indwelled within you. You're telling God you're too weak to fix it. God absolutely can fix it, and he can accomplish in an instant what you cannot do with an entire lifetime. James is saying, you don't have the power. You can't clean your mouth up. You're right, it is impossible. But nothing's impossible for our God. Remember, so much of the book of James is about Christian maturity. (laughs) James does not want you to remain a spiritual infant. James is encouraging these people to accept the call with a great seriousness and move from milk to meat. I had to throw food in here somewhere. And he's telling us, in our flesh, in our sin, in our rage, we have no power over the tongue, but the mature man and woman of God does. Man is incapable of gaining mastery over his own emotions, over his own sins, over his own speech, but through the Spirit of God and his maturing us through trials, which he established in chapter 1, deepening us through afflictions, growing us through knowledge of the Holy One and renewing and conforming and fruit-bearing, it is possible. God can mature every single person in here to a place where we may not be perfect in our fallen bodies, but to a place where we can navigate our emotions and our words in a much more consistently God-honoring way. It's not that a Christian doesn't sin, it's that a Christian is grieved by their sins. And when they sin, they say, God, make me better. There's the difference. You're striving for holiness, not defaulting to unrighteousness. This is what James is getting at. No one has the power of her, but the Spirit of God in you can change you. So there it is. There's the heart of the book of James. We must give our tongues to God and that this is possible. But also, that if we don't give our tongues to God, Satan will gladly have them. And he will gladly take your tongue and he will gladly burn your life to the ground. You've been warned. Now... (laughs) From this, over the next three verses, James is going to talk about double-mindedness. You know anyone who's double-minded? You could rat yourself out, too, if you want. (laughs) That the church needs to make up their mind. Are you going to have a mouth that is filled with blessings or a mouth that is filled with curses? But you can't do both. That's what James is getting at. To do both is to be double-minded, literally in the Greek, double-souled. It's to act as if you have a dual citizenship, one in heaven and one in hell. That's what double-minded means, dual citizenship. Scary, which is delusion, by the way. If you're not holy to God, you're holy not of God. Verse 8. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is restlessly evil, full of deadly poison, With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. If praising God is the highest form of speech, then cursing is the lowest form of speech. (laughs) James is saying, how can you come to church and praise God and sing the songs and pray the prayers and do the communion and then leave church and bleep, bleep, bleep that bleep and bleep? (laughs) How can you say bad things about people and have your mouth filled with the highest form of speech and then the next moment the lowest form of speech? And remember the context of this letter. James is talking to a group of people who are legitimately being abused. They're legitimately being mistreated. And they're starting to murmur. They're starting to grumble. They're that snake. And James is saying, guys, Don't you know that those people are made in the image of God? Who are you to curse anybody? Didn't Jesus tell us to bless those who persecuted us? Well, he didn't mean that for me. (laughs) Didn't he tell us to turn the other cheek? 
Aren't we instructed by Solomon that a gentle answer turns away wrath? Doesn't Peter tell us to have a ready defense and apologia with both gentleness and respect for those who are coming at you aggressively? James is saying, don't give your mouth on Sunday morning to God and then give your accusers curses by Sunday night. We are to bless those who persecute us. Didn't Jesus model this? He's literally being brutally murdered. And what does he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know. And the reality is when someone comes against you, they don't know. They think they know, but they don't know. They don't know they're being used by Satan. They don't know that what they hate in you is the image of Christ. They don't know. And what they really need is not a good punch in the mouth. What they really need is a good spirit kick to the heart. And God's got to get them, not you. Verse 10 says, From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. You see this? <laughs> Either our mouths are filled with blessings or they're filled with curses, but they cannot be filled with both. You've got to pick a lane. James is giving us very much an Elijah on top of Mount Carmel. Choose this day whom you will serve. With Baal, Baal. With Yahweh, Yahweh. Pick. Because there are no dual citizenships. Either give your mouth to blessing or give it to cursing, but don't go limping between two opinions. Verse 11. And Josh drank his coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Again, this was a very hard passage to study for only because it was so simple. I kept thinking there's got to be some nuggets somewhere. No, James is literally saying the same things over and over and over again because he doesn't want us to miss it. He's telling us as many ways as he can in such repetition, pay attention. This is the issue. And now he's saying, does a good spring give off bad water? No. It's either good water to drink or bad water to drink. Can't be both. Verse 12. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Just as it would be unnatural for a fig tree to bear olives <laughs> and, a, and an olive tree to bear figs, so it is for a Christian to be filled with cursing. Again, he's describing the mature man or woman of God. And maybe, maybe you're a new convert in here. Maybe you've just started to figure out this Christian thing. You know, it can be very discouraging to a new believer because they just feel like they're falling on their face every two seconds. And there's grace there. God knows what you've come from and he's so patient. His mercies are new each day. And he... He wants to mature you, but it's a process. You notice when you got saved, it sometimes took a long time for you to realize, oh, maybe I'm sinning about this thing. God knows. Our, everyone's sanctification looks different, but there comes a point where you need to grow up. There comes a point where you need to stop acting like a child and lead, and lead in godliness. Again, James is saying, as simply as possible throughout this letter, that if your soul belongs to God, he's been establishing this through this entire book, if your soul belongs to God, so must your ears be quick to hear. So must your eyes, don't make partiality. So must your finances. So must your pride. So must your ego. So much your, your work belongs to God. Your allegiances belong to God. And today, so must your mouth. Jesus is not content with having some of you. He wants all of you. And today James moves to the mouth. And that applies to every single person in here, and that especially applies to the teachers. We must guard our mouths with a great seriousness is what he's getting at. And even and especially when people speak ill of us, which is is that impossible? Yep. <laughs> but God can do it. And that's today's text. James laid out what should not be on our tongues today. 
cursing, hatred, evil, poisonous words, which are words that tear down and wound people and misrepresent the one we are called to represent, a holy and pure and righteous God. Words that don't declare dominion or victory in Christ, but words that reflect the curse of mankind. That's what happens. That's what happens when we fill our mouths with curses. We deny the saving power of Jesus Christ and cling to the curse. Not to be so. So the obvious takeaway from today is watch your mouth. <laughs> That's the easy takeaway, right? And this is really hard to do because when's the last time you talked to a non-believer and they didn't curse? <laughs> Near impossible. We are living in a highly politicized, highly vulgar, highly confrontational time in human history, and Christians supernaturally are to operate outside of that. We're not to give in the temptation of cursing back those who curse us. And is this fun? <laughs> Whoever said this was supposed to be fun? I mean, it is fun, but some things aren't fun. Like dying to self. Dying's not fun. And whoever is it easy? No, it's not easy. Is it natural? No. Is it impossible? Yes. <laughs> Again, I can be redundant because James is. Unless the Spirit of God is present and is conforming you into maturity. So let me say this very practical. You ever hear a pastor give a sermon? Hopefully not me, but probably. Have you ever heard a pastor tell you you got to do all this stuff but never actually tells you how to do it? And you walk away and go, okay, live by the Spirit. How do I do that? Well, sermon's over. Okay, here we go. If you have a horrible mouth, now you might try to reduce it. You see, we're crafty. We might try to like nitpick, like, ah, oh, maybe this little crumb of an issue I got. If your mouth is giving the cursing to negativity, you know people that try to tear others down because somehow they think it puts them ahead? No, it doesn't. <laughs> it just brings everyone down. You have an issue with your mouth. According to God, this is not a small problem. So the first thing you have to do is recognize this is not a small issue. I'm a great guy, pay my taxes, love my kids, and I swear like a sailor, but that's okay. No, to God, this is not a small issue. In the book of James, it's the issue. It's the issue. So what I would say is, what are you listening to? What are you watching? If things are filled with curses, guess what? That's going to stain you. It's going to bleed off. Who are you talking to? You know, we're told to take every thought captive to the word of God. You know, so, I know so many people that are trying not to curse, but in their head, it's like that home alone, frug, 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 you know, they're going off. It's like, you need to stop your cursing in your own mind. You, th this, is, this is an upward dredge through a foot and a half of muddy snow. But it's possible through the spirit of God. So again, th there are very practical things. If you're, if you're partaking in things that are, are vile, are filled with curses and anger and hatred, and you have a friends group that this is the only way they know how to communicate, you have to recognize that that might bleed off on you. And if you're cursing, it is bleeding off on you. And so you need to decide, well, is this a small issue or is the Bible telling me the truth? And if it's telling you the truth, you need to make practical steps because habits eat willpower for breakfast. You stand no chance. You have, you have to give it to the Lord and you have to give very practical steps to the Lord. Now, let's go the other way with this, right? Not the way of cursing, which was, I think, the easy, low-hanging low fruit there that we, we should grab, but I, I think we should also think about the way of blessing. The God's people... You know, so can't we make Christianity only about what not to do? Well, that's a trap. We also need to know what to do. <laughs> and we are to have blessings on our tongues. So I want to talk about this in two ways, and we maybe got like five, ten minutes tops. Our mouths are to be filled with blessings because it makes us like Christ. Who is the picture, the model of maturity in the scriptures? 
It's Jesus. To give your, the fill your mouth like a chipmunk with the blessings is to make us like Christ. When God saves you, he fills you with the spirit of Christ. And it was of Jesus that we read this in John 7, 46. It's so good. The officer answered, no one ever spoke like this man. You know, I think about that verse all the time. No one spoke like this man. If you are being matured and conformed into the image of the Son, you will begin to sound so differently than the world around you. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I would recommend you yield yourself to the Scriptures. Because when you get around truly godly people, they talk differently. There's something there. There's a spark of divine. There's a city on a hill. There's salt and light. There's something different. And when people heard Jesus talk and you're filled with the same spirit, there's something magnetizing about the way that he used his mouth. Now we also read uh, a Jesus on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? There's something about the way that he spoke. Remember in Acts chapter 4, remember the apostles are out there, they're healing people, they're giving sermons, and the Pharisees look at them and they realize it says that they had been with Jesus. There's something about the way Jesus' people spoke that was radical. Remember when the resurrected Christ came to Mary? Remember what he said to her? Not, I am the Lord. He simply said, Mary. She goes, Rabbi! <laughs> she falls on his feet. Teacher, don't cling to me, woman. Uh, sorry, now I'm going off on that passage. But uh, <laughs> see, now I'm, we're going to preach John today. Never mind James. Um, but there's something about the way he spoke. And there's something about the way his people should talk to. In, in a way that not only honors God, but impacts the lives of the people around them. And so, loved ones, if you want Jesus to be Lord of your soul, if you want true and not worthless religion, then also give him your mouth. <laughs> and let him fill it with blessings. As his mouth, we were told, possessed the words of life. In Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth, remember? And he said, let there be light. You know, he could have thought it. He could have thought light. He could have blinked at it, and it would have happened. But he spoke. There's something about being associated with God Almighty that he wants our mouths purified and filled with life because his mouth is filled with life. And, he's, and the Father is introduced as one whose mouth is filled with life. And if we're going to be of Jesus, we're going to be of the Father. And so to be... A mouth filled with blessings is to being conformed and matured into the image of the Son. Secondly, coffee break. By filling our mouth with blessings as opposed to cursing and hatred, we bring life to ourselves and the people around us. Isn't it true so often when we're around non-believers that they only can communicate in negatives? <laughs> you notice that? They're mad about something. <laughs> like always mad about something or they're always upset about something or can you believe so-and-so did this or I would, that's what the tabloids are about. Do you see them leaving the bar at three in the morning? Mm -mm -mm. Right? Do you know, you know, Angeline is with Brangeline and Brangeline is with Brad and it's like, who cares? They do. It's always drama. And we as the church in this culture, this can bleed off on us. And we can be impacted and influenced by that. And unfortunately, we can also learn to only communicate in negatives. As James just asserted, as Jude will say later, um, it can literally stain our life. That word stain there is literally like poop. You get poop on your clothes is what cursing's like. It just can get on you. But you are to be of a different spirit. <laughs> Proverbs 18.4 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Our culture is dying. 
People are dying out there, physically, emotionally, spiritually. People are dying. But you have the power of life on your tongue. Solomon says in Proverbs 14, 4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Your mouth can be a fruit-bearing tree, can be a tree that gives off life. So as we go, we're in a culture that almost doesn't even know how to speak without cursing. (laughs) Almost doesn't even know how to talk without negativity or vulgarity. But loved ones, if you're If you give your speech to the Lord and let him fill your mouth with blessings, with life and holiness, not only will that please the Lord, but it will radically change your life. This is not a small issue. This is a way to radically change the course of your life. Your ship will find navigation, the wildfires avoided, the horse controlled. Giving your mouth to God will not only radically change your life as it radically changes the outcome of so many situations, but God has made the tongue so powerful, that little thing in your mouth has made it so powerful. It has not just the power to tear down, but the power to rebuild, the power to give life, the power to bless, the power to build up. Is in the, it is within the tongue. I was at the um, I was at the farmers market yesterday in Bel Air. It was raining, so like we came, we were all under tents. And uh, there's a guy I see there. He's probably a young twenty year old something man. And he um, every time I go there, I get a coffee. I don't even want a coffee, but he's like Josh. And uh, last time we were eating pecans together, so that was fun. Do you want some pecans? Sure. So we were eating pecans. I make friends everywhere I go. It's just something that happens. Um, or enemies, I don't know, maybe. I don't know. Who says? But I brought Nathan and Caleb with me yesterday, my two sons, and they both wanted decaf coffees. And so I brought them up and I said, Nathan, tell them what you want. Like, <laughs> you have a mouth. And, and he likes stirring the sugar in. It's a whole thing. But he's like, I want a decaf coffee. And then he looks at me and I'm like, medium, right? And we do that thing. And then Caleb, I go, go ahead, Caleb, tell him what you want. And he just goes up to the guy and he goes, I love you. (laughs) And the guy's face was so touched. He goes, I love you too. And he looked at me like, like you just got a bear hug from someone. But it would have been a a bad day. He was rained on all day, and then he had ended in a smile because a five-year-old says, I love you. But as power, our mouth has a simple. If we fill it with blessing, it has power. You know the Proverbs 31 woman, it says she has kindness on the tip of her tongue. Life on the tip of her tongue. As believers, we are to be kind and patient and gentle and quick to build others up. But what I really think this means, the way to your kindness is to use your mouth primarily to point to the life giver. The greatest blessing you can give to somebody is to give them Christ. And to bless those who persecute you is to be like Stephen, to share the gospel with them means to mean good for people, to share the good news to people who even mean you evil. The superlative act of kindness is to share the message of our Lord Jesus Christ. What are we told? Faith comes by hearing. And the church is to be one speaking of the excellencies of our God. Martin Luther said the church is not a the church is a mouth house, not a pen house. We are a people of the word. And so the reason James doesn't want us speaking vulgarly or responding with anger to anger is because that blows our witness. It misrepresents our Lord and the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how could we possibly, honest, just think about it logically, how could we possibly communicate the good news when our mouths are filled with hatred? How could we possibly boast of God's saving grace and mercy when we're graceless and merciless? How can we rejoice in our salvation when we are filled with condemnation of others? 
How can we have the words of life if our mouth is filled with the flames of hell? We are to have kingdom mouths, mouths that are consecrated to the king, mouths like Isaiah, purified by fire, mouths that build people up and point them to Christ, mouths that encourage. You know you are to come to church to encourage each other and build one another up to both love and good works. You have that power through the Spirit of God. Your mouth is to be as a tree of life that point to the one who died on the tree. The one whose mouth, the one whose soul rather, belongs to God is to have a mouth that belongs to God. And that mouth is to be filled with blessings. And again, to be redundant as James is here, the ultimate blessing you can give somebody is to tell them of our Lord. And it's not that we can't, because we can take this too far, can't we? Can't someone like like talk about something and be like, now, 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 brother. <laughs> Only nice thoughts. We can address bad things. You can do that, you know. When, th- when someone's acting a fool, you can be like, all right, that, this is ridiculous. You can, you, can, you can talk about these things, and it's not that you can't ever not talk about these things. Of course not. But we're to do it from a place of love. We're to do it from a place of restoration. If you're frustrated with American politics, it's not that you want to see a firing squad. It's that you want to see people come to Christ. But if we point to things that are wrong and are infuriate, can't we so quickly become murmurers? Just all the time. We act as freshwater wells filled with bitterness, which is not to be. So my final petition this morning is choose this day whom you will serve and then give them your mouth. Let's pray. God, we, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. You are the God most high and there is none beside you. You are Jehovah Jireh, you are. Wonderful, merciful, merciful, mighty God, Prince of Peace. You are so good and kind to your people. And God, as you have, it says that you sing over us. God, fill our mouths with praise. Fill it with blessing. Fill it with kindness. Let us not become stained by this world and the evil things of this world, but mature us into being godly Christ-like men and women for your glory. We pray for those in here that do not know you and online that do not know you, that they would grow weary, weary of the other way and may submit and yield to you, our Lord Jesus, this very day. Let them walk with you, a life led and filled by your Spirit. God, we pray that you would build an insatiable, (laughs) insatiable hunger to study your word. And let us be conformed and renewed and transformed by it. We pray for those in here that are tired and weary, and maybe they've defaulted to disgruntled. (laughs) That God, you would remind them that this is not a small thing and that you would give them an extra measure of grace and bone-saturating awareness of your presence in their life. And you may restore them this Lord's day. Resurrect their joy in you. God, we pray for anyone in here who needs special prayer that they go and talk to our prayer team off by the side. And God, thank you, thank you, thank you for filling us with your spirit and not leaving us in an absolutely hopeless situation. And in Jesus' name, all of God's people said, stand and worship. That's today's message from Calvary Baltimore. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to know more about us, visit calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Our email address is calvarybaltimore1 at gmail.com. That's calvarybaltimore, then the number one, at gmail.com. To financially support the work God is doing through Calvary Baltimore, go to calvarychapelbaltimore.org and click Give. And if you're in the area, stop by on a Sunday morning. For directions and service times, go to our website at calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Live streams and weekly sermons are available on our website, our Facebook page, and YouTube. 
You can also watch with our mobile app and on Apple TV and Roku. Search for Calvary Chapel Baltimore on these platforms for instant access to great Bible teaching and encouragement. We hope you've been blessed by this week's teaching. Until next time, as Pastor Josh says, study the Word, to live the Word, to share the Word. And join us again for the next Calvary Baltimore Weekly Sermon.